The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you are coming to me. Jesus said to him in reply, Allow it now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. After Jesus was baptized, he came up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened for him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming upon him. And a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. <clears throat> the Gospel of the Lord. Before I start my homily today on the baptism of Christ, I want to tell you a story. It's a story that's 2,000 years old. It was written by the early church fathers. It comes down to us in writing. It comes down to us also as an oral tradition as well. And I don't even know how many times when I was in a seminary, uh, I came across it in the studying of the church fathers, a very common and well-known story. I wanted to tell this story, the Feast of the Holy Family, which was two weeks ago, but for some reason or another, I didn't have time to tell the story, so I figured this time I'll start out with the story first. And the story has it that that Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, of course, Joseph was told by the angel to take the child because they're out, they want to kill the child. Take the child and the mother and flee to Egypt. It was a long journey, a difficult journey. And they had to pass through a mountain range, which was very difficult, but it was also known for its highway robbers that lived in the mountains in caves. Joseph knew these things, but he went trusting in God. So off he went. As they get into the mountain range, they're walking along, and all of a sudden, as it's getting a little bit darker, the sun hasn't quite set yet. There's a band of robbers sort of close in around them. Joseph stops. Mary's riding on a donkey. She's holding the little baby Jesus. And the head thief looks at this poor family and says, they don't have anything. There's nothing here to steal. Let's leave them alone. So he invited the holy family as it was getting darker, to come into the cave with him and his wife. And they accepted his generous offer. And they ate. And after the meal, Mary asked for a bowl of warm water because she wanted to give the baby Jesus a bath. And she gave baby Jesus a bath, and she was finished. She was going to take the water and throw it out outside. When the wife of the robber came to her very quietly and whispered to her and begged her and said, Please, would it be possible for me to wash my baby? in this water. There is something about you and your family that is different. I have a three-year-old boy who has severe leprosy. That's why we're living in this cave. 
and have to, we have to hide him when people come over. We keep him in one of the back caves. Would it be possible for me to use this water to bathe him? And Mary said, certainly. So the woman went and got her three-year-old boy. And she began to wash this three-year-old boy in the same water that Jesus was just bathed in. And she noticed as she was washing the baby, something very unusual was taking place. His leprosy literally was peeling off of his skin. He literally was healed from top to bottom. No more leprosy. And the woman cried. And she knew that there was something about this family that was different. Mary and Joseph didn't say anything to them because they had to leave. So they spent the night, of course, and the next morning they got up. And the family gave them all the food that they needed for the donkey and for themselves for their journey because there's yet a long journey to go. And... We know nothing else in a sense about this three-year-old boy. We don't see him in the scriptures. We don't really know what happened to him, but the traditions tell us, interestingly enough, Christ is hanging on the cross nearly 30 years later. And a good thief on his right side asks for forgiveness, Dismas. Tradition tells us it was the same young boy who was healed of leprosy at the age of three. His mother told him that story about this holy family coming through their neighborhood and coming and staying with them and him being healed. Obviously, he wasn't healed in his soul because he kept he was a thief. But he always remembered it. He had no doubt and no hesitation of thinking that possibly this man hanging on this cross was probably that young child who passed through my home and healed me of leprosy. And therefore, he asked for forgiveness for his sins. And Jesus said to him, this day you will be with me in paradise. It's a beautiful story that has long been lost by many. We don't think about it because nobody tells the story anymore. But I made myself a promise, even when I was in a seminary, every year when I had an opportunity especially the Feast of the Holy Family, to tell this story because it shows the interconnection that Christ already has with his people at a very young age. But anyways, we have to talk a little bit about the baptism of Christ. Did Christ need to be baptized? What's the difference between the baptism of John the Baptist and the baptism that we do in church? It's not hard to figure out. The baptism that John the Baptist did was what we call a ritual baptism. It was a rite. Ritual baptism. It contained contained absolutely zero amount of grace. None. Zero. And... The one that we receive and have received for 2,000 years or we receive until the end of time, the sacramental baptism brings into the soul grace. It brings God, which John's baptism could not do. Now, there were three different rites in the Old Testament, which were what we could call baptism of sorts. First was the baptism of water. 
As Moses brought Aaron and his sons to the doors of the tabernacle and washed them with water, this was followed by a baptism of oil when Moses put oil upon Aaron's head in order to sanctify him. The final baptism was one of blood. Moses took the blood of the ram um, and the ram of consecration and put it upon Aaron's right ear and upon the thumb of his right hand, upon the great toe of his right foot. This ritual implied a gradual consecration. These baptisms would have their counterpart, of course, in Christ, especially at the River Jordan, the water, the transfiguration, the spirit, and Calvary, the blood. The baptism of, in the Jordan was simply a prelude to the baptism of he was later, would later speak, the baptism of his passion. Twice afterwards did he refer to his baptism. The first time when James and John asked him if they could sit on either side uh, or in his kingdom, and he answered, he asked if they were ready to be baptized with the baptism which he was going to receive. Thus his baptism of water looked forward to the baptism of blood. The Jordan flowed into the red rivers of Calvary. The second time he referred to his baptism when he said to his apostles, I have a baptism to undergo, and what constraint I am until the ordeal is over. If you ever have an opportunity to go to Jerusalem, and when I was a younger man and I was in a seminary and I had an opportunity to take a semester uh, in Jerusalem, um, I spent an entire semester there, which I thought was absolutely fascinating because you learn so much more when you're in a particular area and you get to see the things uh, where the scripture speaks of something even in the Old Testament and you know where it's at and you know where it happened and so on and so on. Um, and the story has it, of course, that um, we of course, saw supposedly the spot where Christ was baptized by John. Many people today don't believe that this is where it took place and so on and so on. But we do understand that there was no grace involved, none. It was simply what we call, what John calls, you know, metanoia, turnaround. Turn around from your old way of life and not just turn away from sin, but turn your mind around. Turn, a mind, turn your mind away from your own selfishness, your own pride, and your own egos and be converted to God and follow God. Of course, for John, it was follow the law. That's all they had. Christ would come and baptize with water and the spirit, of course, as even John told them. In the waters of the Jordan, he was identified with sinners in the baptism of his death. He would bear the full burden of their guilt. Through the baptism of Christ in the river Jordan, for that, from that moment forward, every act of baptism was sanctified throughout history, throughout time, for 2,000 years until the end of time. Christ was not sanctified at that moment. God spoke, yes, it was a revelation, and, only, and John saw it. Only John saw it. He knew. But we would know also that at that moment of our own personal baptism, or if we attend a baptism, the Holy Trinity is present. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit but Christ had to go through it first, not sacramentally, but ritually, so we could actually have the sacrament of baptism as a sanctifying grace. Some years ago, I worked in a hospital, and I had to share an office for many months with a Baptist, I mean, not a Baptist, but a Methodist minister. Now, I'm not sure that all Methodists believe this particular theology or whatever you might want to call it, but we had many, many discussions about many, many different topics, and baptism was one of them. And I was very much surprised when he said to me that Jesus didn't know who he was until he was baptized. Really. He was 30 years old. You mean to tell me anybody here in the congregation is 30 years old, does, as you may not even be baptized, doesn't know who they are? You've got to be kidding me. 
They believe that Jesus didn't know about his mission. He didn't know what God had for him. And actually, I've watched seen movies where Christ is talking to Mary Magdalene. He's scratching his head, and he says, well, I know I know, I have something I have to do. I just don't know what it is. And I said, well, the Baptist or the Methodist must have been involved in making that movie. Because Christ, from the moment he was conceived, always knew he was God. Always. He knew exactly why he came on earth. He came to die. He knew who he was as the son of God and the son of Mary. Because the sacred humanity of Christ would be the connecting link between heaven and earth. The voice from heaven which declared him to be the beloved son of the eternal father was not announcing a new fact or new sonship of the Lord. It was merely making a solemn declaration of that sonship which had existed from all eternity, but now was beginning to manifest itself publicly as mediator between God and man. That Christ who came out of the water as the earth had come out of the water at the creation after the flood, as Moses and his people had come out of the waters of the Red Sea, he by now was glorified by the Holy Spirit appearing in a form of a dove. The Spirit of God never appears in the figure of a dove anywhere but here. The dove was a symbol of gentleness and peacefulness. As I said in my homily last night, you know, baptism gives the human being many, many graces. Graces that unfold throughout our entire lives. It's not just a one-time act that somehow ceases to be or ceases to exist or ceases somehow to have its effect upon us. No, it has an effect upon us all the days of our lives. It's supposed to transform us. God marks us for himself. And one day when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ, we'll notice that we'll have a cross on our forehead Yes, through baptism, that is imprinted upon our souls. That's why when somebody's baptized, the water must be poured on the forehead three times. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in order to make it a valid baptism. At that moment, the person is marked for all eternity, whether in heaven or in hell, it doesn't matter. For all eternity, they're now marked as a baptized human being, and for all time, for this time on earth anyways. We're supposed to grow in holiness, gentleness, and peacefulness, the two virtues that the the Christian human being, through the gift of baptism, is supposed to live. But we don't know how to be gentle and peaceful today. We don't. It's sad. To find somebody who is gentle is a difficult thing. To find somebody who is peaceful is even harder. The human being today is under a lot of pressure, a lot of doubts, a lot of fears, a lot of confusion. And therefore, he doesn't really know how to use the grace that God gives to him. So therefore, he doesn't really grow in that holiness. But baptism takes the human being to the Eucharist. I know many people like to think that baptism is about salvation. It's sad because we Catholics have bought into the same stupid ideology uh, as our brothers and sisters in Christ that once baptized, always baptized, saved, end of story. That's it. Don't buy into it because we have to work out our salvation every day. Nothing is automatic. You don't just pull a lever because you're baptized and say, ah, out comes salvation and that's it. I'm going to heaven. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't exist. It's a lie. The church has always taught that we must work out our salvation beginning, of course, in baptism. When we are given the gifts and the fruits of the Holy Spirit in what is called seed form to be fulfilled in confirmation and from there to grow in holiness through prayer and the other sacraments, above all, the Eucharist. Baptism takes me to the Eucharist. It's not just about salvation. I don't know how many times throughout the years People have asked me to baptize their child. I've got no clue why they're asking the baby to be baptized. They don't go to church. I don't know what kind of prayer life they have. And usually I take time and talk with these people to see where they're coming from. 
But we're sort of caught up in that idea that somehow, okay, if they're baptized, they'll be saved. Well, no. If they're baptized, they have a greater responsibility to work out their salvation. No excuses. So parents and godparents have a duty and responsibility, of course, to teach the child about God and how to live a virtuous and fruitful life. But we often forget. Christ's first revelation of the interior life, and I've often talked about this many, many times, and one of the things I want to do this year a little bit more is to talk about that interior life the inside, the human being, you know, because all the sacraments transform the human being interiorly. It doesn't change the car I drive. It doesn't change the home I live in. It doesn't decorate my house. Uh, it doesn't give me different flavors for the food that I like. No, it's about the interior of man. And here in baptism, we see for the very first time the being of God through this gesture, teaching us interior humility, how to be humble before God and humble before others and humble before ourselves to be always humble. But in order to do that, we have to take the path of penance and regeneration. We have to be renewed. As John the Baptist said, metanoia, to be transformed mentally, to think differently, to no longer think about sins, to no longer be drawn to sins, but to be drawn to God and be drawn to holiness. Through baptism, God wills that the sinner to turn away from the darkness of his own nothingness, his ignorance and his emptiness and his selfishness and to stop living his life as if he had fruits or draw, drew from his life of sin but to draw life from God because otherwise we live simply in an illusion where we look in our own eyes and think we have some sort of greatness in the end what happens the soul is baptized dies of thirst right at the fountain's edge because they never changed. And Jesus is coming to John seeking the baptism of water. We witness Christ's first teaching to man about the divine life. It is a gesture and an act of self-abasement, an acknowledgement of human frailty, but at the same time of the sublimity of man's vocation, to awaken in one's life to the life of God and to understand one's frailties, darkness, and weaknesses.